who is a chair of sociology at the University College Dublin. And Professor Maleshevich will talk about resurrecting national greatness, the golden age myth, and the formation of Balkan nation states. Professor Maleshevich, you have the floor. Okay. Thanks very much, Sergio, for organizing this event, for inviting us. It's, uh, I'll try also to share uh, my slides. Let me just see where are they now? Screen share. Why do I? Okay, here they are. Just a second, yeah. In the beginning. Can you can you see the the slides? Uh, yes, could I? No slides, but I can see your folders. Could I possibly uh, steal this sociology yeah, theory book folder of yours? I would love to read the content of it. <laughs> yeah. Can you see it now? I mean, is it, is it... it says you, your uh, screen. Uh, uh, Sinish, I think you shared the whole screen. At the bottom screen. of your, your screen, there should be. Don't, don't share the whole screen. When you just go there, I, I, stop, stop sharing because you're sharing all your secrets here. Okay. <laughs> so what should I do? <laughs> so... Uh, I just go, go, let me just see if I can go to my slide here. Yes, go, go to your slide and open slides uh, in. Uh, is, this, and yes. then is this slides. okay? Is, is this fine? Can you see it now? Uh, uh, we can see you. No. You don't see the slides, is it? No. Sinisha, no. uh, go on, sh share screen again. Share. The green are down in the middle. Share screen, right? Under your chins. No, this is not. So, okay, I'll, I'll leave this now. Sorry for about, about this. It's uh, that way. So, sh share screen, and then where do I go? It, it gives me this basic advanced file. I don't know. File explore, Explorer. Uh, Oh, now you, you have started share screening. Oh, but it opens up your your uh, folder lineup. Yeah. Instead of a specific presentation. Is it any close close uh, all those open windows and leave your PowerPoint so that you can pick it up? Maybe you got too much on your desktop. Yeah, because I don't, I don't actually have anything, but it gives me, it, it just leads, gives me a, if I go to this thing, is it, can you see it now? No. Share. Really sorry about this. Screen share. Maybe this one. Let's see if it works. Do you see this? Yes. It, is it proper slide? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Good. Great. So I'm sorry about this. I'm really terrible. Yes, it <laughs> Thanks. Good. Okay, so, so the, the idea behind this presentation is really to look at the role of uh, golden age myths, the way they play in, in nationalist narratives. And I want to look at this, how it, it has changed over the course of history. So I'll be focusing really on the 19th century and contemporary period. Uh, and and uh, as this is a kind of starting point is this slide from the commemoration of the, uh, that has taken place just a few days ago about the last Bosnian queen, uh, Katerina Kosača. And this was organized by the youth wing of the Croatian uh, main party, HDZ. Uh, and the imagery here is interesting to look because it obviously, it tries to project this continuity with the past, with the medieval uh, uh, past, uh, Bosnian uh, uh, history, which is obviously Croatized. So everything here, the imagery is, is very much emphasizing the Croat Croatian element, Croatian continuity, uh, in Bosnia in, in some respect. And obviously this has provoked a lot of uh, 
attention and, and, and it is a con contested uh, you know interpretation uh, by in, in Bosnia and, and elsewhere uh, so so what I want to do really is to look at the way how medieval uh, uh, age uh, golden age myths have been used and 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 how this interpretation uh, has has changed o o over history and, and obviously golden age myths play a, a crucial role in, in all nationalist narratives uh, and uh, historical sociologists and theorists of nationalism have tried to explain why they have a, a play such an important role so so basically i'll simplify it here we will have we have two kind of uh, different interpretations that have dominated uh, this field the culturalist interpretations like smith and hutchinson who see golden age narratives as, as a cultural reservoir of nationhood it, it is something to do with projecting this heroic virtue and glory of the past in order to uh, uh, to, to kind of enhance social status. So today might, we might not be big, important nation, but once we were great, we were glorious, we were big, we were important and so on. Uh, so it is also something to do with, uh, with uh, acknowledging a decline uh, and, and trying to explain and regain, resurrect this, this image of, of virtue and, and greatness. Uh, so, so in that context, the narratives of golden age are, are, are central according to cultures they're seen as a cultural source of collective identification and they generate shared collective meaning for members of the nation. In contrast, uh, a kind of more in instrumentalist explanations, you know, by, from Hobsbawm all the way to Bauman, see golden age as a tool of, of uh, kind of uh, mass control, mass pacification. The golden age narrative is, is seen as really a form of social engineering used by uh, political elites to pacify ma you know, mass, mass followers. Uh, you know, the, obviously Hobsbawm's you know, concept of invented tradition, is, it comes here to mind. It implies a certain continuity with the past and broken continuity, emphasizing this uh, continuity in order to, to uh, kind of maintain status quo and to maintain uh, uh, economic and political dominance of particular elites. Bauman talks about retrotopia as, as a, some sort of a pallid nostalgia or an imagined past, an attempt to overcome the structural anxieties of the day by idealizing national past. Uh, so, so what I want to do is to kind of go beyond these explanations. I think some of this, what they're saying makes sense, but it, it's not really, uh, doesn't uh, capture the, the complexity of this phenomenon. Uh, uh, and, and also it doesn't capture the long-term change, you know, because this changes. I mean, the golden age myths are interpreted very differently in the 19th century in the 20th century and today. Uh, so uh, for me, Golden Age imagery is much more than a simple sentimental story of longing and yearning for imaginary past. It's an ideological project that underpins and sustains all nationalist narratives, uh, including those that challenge the existing order and also those that aim to, uh, you know, kind of uh, create a new, new social order. So, so we cannot reduce this phenomenon just to kind of radical right wing extremists, uh, uh, this is really something that, that is present throughout society and throughout a variety of political groups. Uh, and here you see kind of a list of some of these golden, main golden age myths. Obviously there are many, many others in, in, you know, in, in the context of medieval Balkan kingdoms, the Bulgarian empire uh, under Simon the Great, the Serbian empire under uh, Tsar Dusan Mighty, the Croatian kingdom under Tamislav, Bosnian kingdom the third for the first, Montenegrin principalities, Duklia and uh, the Mihail and Konstantin Bodin, uh, Dardania under uh, Bardilis uh, in, in the context of Albanian nationalism and so on. These are some of the imagery, which are obviously coats of arms of kind of uh, medieval rulers and medieval royal families, which are now na then nationalized you know, from 19th century onwards and become symbols of nationhood and are used by the states to legitimize and project this uh, link with the past. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, what I want to do is to kind of go away from the from the kind of culturalist uh, uh, overemphasis on, on functionalism of, sh of shared cultural meanings, but also to go away from the utilitarian emphasis on the elite, which obviously is important, but it, it changes. It doesn't work the same uh, if you look over the course of history. Uh, so we have to focus a little bit more on the cultural and historical variability of this phenomenon, and we have to look also at the changes organizational. Uh, changes that have taken place, structural changes in these societies in the Balkans, in order to understand how they actually these golden age, uh, uh, nationalist golden age uh, narratives operate and how they change. Because all nationalist organizations use a lot of these myths, but not all of them are successful in, in generating mass support. 
so uh, if you look at the 19th century, uh, you know, uh, these golden age meets become used by the state for the first time properly in a more systematic way. Uh, but what's also interesting is that in Balkans, nationalism is very, I mean, I've written about this extensively. Nationalism is really very late development as, as a mass phenomenon. Uh, because we, we are essentially uh, encountering societies with very low literacy rates, uh, where the local and re religious attachments were much stronger than what would eventually become a national. Also, there is no infrastructural basis for the spread of a cross-class ideology that is nationalism, communication networks very low, you know, urban areas completely underdeveloped, uh, small administration, weak states. So I'm talking about uh, 19, mid-19 mid uh, century Balkans. Uh, so nas nationalism becomes much more important uh, after the states uh, in, the, uh, in the Balkans were established, uh, and uh, whether they have achieved partial independence or full independence uh, by the end of 19th century, and, and nationalism then becomes a prerogative of the, of the political establishment, state officials, nationalist intellectuals, some civil society groups, uh, and the focus here is really on, on, on trying to establish yourself and, and legitimize yourself in the world, European world. And this is still a, a world of empires, you know, so we have to bear in mind that a lot of this imagery that is borrowed like these symbols uh, are imperial in nature because you're really projecting uh, your legitimacy to other imperial states like Britain and France and, and, and Belgium and, 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 you know, they were all imperial states. So, so the idea is that you, you link the, these links with the glorious past uh, in, in order to justify your very existence. Uh, so, so we do have a kind of a lot of uh, emphasis in, let's say in, the, in the Serbian discourse of uh, late 19th century, uh, uh, it's you know, the importance of Dushan's kingdom and Dushan's code. And, and this is a quote from 19th century uh, text is described as the most precious monument that the medieval period has left us. School textbooks, uh, you know, published in Serbia at that time talk about, this is also a quote from, from 19th century textbook, the golden age of serbdom, neither before nor after was Ser Serbia so powerful and famous under Dushan or Serbian empire flourished under this man of tall stature, handsome face, resolute and brave. So he's idealized in every sense, you know, he's even beautiful and everything else. Uh, similar things we have with, kind of with the Croatian Golden Age portrayals in this in, in the late 19th century. Uh, you know, we, we already see the beginning of this thousand-year-old myth of continuity of Croatian statehood from medieval Croatia of Tomislav and Zvonimir to the present. And this is a quote from a textbook in the uh, 19th century uh, uh, describing the crowning of King Tomislav in 925. This was the most important event in the earliest history of Croatia because Croatia had now become a kingdom and she gained the ruler of its own blood and language. Thus, Tomislav, the first king of Croats, united the nation. Grateful national tradition bestows on him the title of the great king. Obviously, the, the, you know, this, these are the kind of the first attempts to nationalize something that was obviously has nothing to do with, with, with nation. It, you know, these were all, uh, you know, dynastic uh, uh, identities that dominated in medieval times. Uh, so, so the key feature of the 19th century uh, golden age uh, uh, interpretations is that they are very much top down. Uh, uh, the narratives of glorious past are created, developed, perpetuated by the state officials, cultural political elites, uh, and uh, you know, teachers, educationalists, state administrators, some journalists, uh, while the minor my majority of the population you know, didn't really relate to these yet. You know, so this is important thing. The nationalism is still very very narrowly based, uh, you know, very uh, top, top down phenomenon. Uh, and the idea is really not on preserving the status quo, but uh, enacting, you know, a social change. So nationalists of golden age in this period were not deployed to preserve the existing order, but to generate a new one. And we have two really principal political goals in this period. First is to legitimize the very existence of the newly created states uh, uh, and to justify also their, their future expansion. So that's the project of Megali, Megali idea in Greece and greater Serbia and later on greater Bulgaria and Romania and greater Croatia and, 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 and so on and so forth. And the second, second uh, uh, pro a goal is to create culturally and politically homogeneous population that will be loyal to the new states. Because again, bearing in mind majority population here don't, do not identify 
with, with the supposed nation. They're still very much locally uh, identifying with clan, with religion, with, with uh, uh, villages and, and things like that. Uh, one of the key components of, of kind of, you know, this project is uh, changing the, the kind of educational character of the population, because in, in, in 1864, 95.8% of the population of Serbia is still illiterate, so almost everybody is illiterate. Bulgaria, in, even in 1884, 95.5% of male population illiterate and 98.5% of female population, it means almost everybody. Albania gets first primary school only in 1887. And you know, there are so many of them. So the states are really focused on nationalizing population, peasant, predominantly peasant population, building you know, these institutions that Gellner talks about, of high culture, theaters, museums, concert halls. These are all means of nationalizing. Uh, and, and, and the golden age narratives play an important part in, in theaters and plays. And also military draft was a very important mechanism of nationalization. So the key issue really for this period is that national myths of golden age serve as a didactic stories that would turn ordinary and uh, you know peasants into uh, to use the peasants into Frenchmen uh, 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 discourse here in the Serbs into Croats into um, uh, uh, others. So now we, we'll we'll turn to the 21st century uh, where things change. So these golden age myths are are very much still present, very visible, even more so than ever before. Uh, so, so it is important to look at us how golden age narratives develop, expand, and change, uh, and they change because structural context changes. So this is uh, some some of the kind of imagery, uh, you know, from popular culture uh, that that kind of was already present. So these are the images from 1980s, you, still during the, the state socialist period in the Balkans. Uh, you know, this is really the most important, I would argue that the 20th century period is most important in terms of nationalization of population because, you know, literacy rates have been traced, modernization kicked on, industrialization, everything else. But I will not be focusing on the 20th century, I'll focus only on the 21st. Uh, the key issue here is obviously the state has expanded dramatically. Administrative capacity, coercive capacity of the state has expanded. For example, in early 19th century, Serbia had only 24 civil servants. Uh, today, Serbia has more than 600,000 uh, administrators. Uh, there were only 16 primary schools and uh, about 800 students in 1830. Today, there is more than half a million uh, uh, pupils in, in Serbia. All the Balkan countries are now fully literate from 98% to 99% literacy rate. So this is a profoundly different world. Uh, 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 and, and they've experienced organizational changes in so many different directions. Uh, so nationalism has changed also. In 19th century, nationalism was a preserve of the kind of the elite, the establishment, uh, and particularly the state employees. This was a state project. In the 21st century, nationalism is a mass phenomenon dispersed throughout the whole society. Uh, so it, it cannot be easily controlled by the state. Uh, and, and the key features really of the golden age narratives in the 21st century is that they are uh, developed uh, also not only by the state, the state continues to do that, but even more so they're top down, they're bottom up. They're more uh, developed from within civil society groups. Uh, and, and, and there are so many different organizations and parties and movements and uh, organized individuals and small groups that are engaged in this kind of proliferation of nationalist content. So uh, as there is this competition, you know, for, for claiming nationalist narratives and particularly uh, golden age ones, there is a tendency also to, to, to be more radical, to radicalize these versions of existing golden age mythologies. So as I said, this was all very much present in the communist period. And here we see kind of uh, from Bulgaria, you know, Simeon the Great's reign was celebrated with the lavish drama series indicatively named Golden Age, uh, Zlatne at Vek. Uh, which was filmed in 1984. This is in the middle here, on, if you see it. Uh, and it's still very popular and, and, and shown on Bulgarian TV channels. Then we have the brand of high quality brandy on the left, Simeon the Great, it's called. Uh, and then we have, you know, obviously the, the books on, on Stefan Dushan. Uh, you know, this was also published by Anastasievich in, in the 80s and was very popular. Uh, so na nationalist narratives now become grounded throughout the societies across different social strata among people with very different political orientations. So these are some of the images that you know kind of we see in a popular culture. Uh, you know, constant references to medieval times, 
Duchamp's medieval state, uh, you know, and this is not only far right, but also, uh, you know, also anti-globalist left and, and a lot of centrist uh, groups and movements, you know, there's a, a, a lot of emphasis on, you know, kind of recreating uh, Duchamp's empire, new Duchamp's uh, uh, novo Duchamp's tsarstvo. Uh, this is present in sports, in entertainment, in hospitality, uh, among ordinary, you know, kind of amateur historian, amateur archaeological groups, uh, uh, video games, uh, you know, popular, lots of obviously on social media. Uh, and, and, you know, here we see tattoos of, of you know, very much uh, uh, present. Harris was also showing these other tattoos, but these are also interesting medieval, you know, King Tomislav tattoos. And uh, the, if you look one on here uh, on, on the uh, right, uh, my right, uh, we, we see the kind of uh, uh, medieval army of, of uh, Tsar Dushan is fighting ISIS and, and gays and NATO and EU all the same, at the same time. <laughs> so, so in a sense, they kind of projecting all the kind of, uh, you know, enemies uh, and, and using this image of the golden age. Then we have a, you know, kind of uh, everyday uh, 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 devices used, in, you know, kind of T-shirts with, with uh, restaurants with uh, 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 Dushan's empire and, you know, fighting club, uh, uh, restaurant, King Zvonimir, uh, uh, Brandy, uh, Bodin and uh, sports football club and, and things like that. Even children's uh, 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 books for, written for children, uh, like one, Dushan, the mighty childhood of future Tsar, uh, so, so this is prevalent throughout society. TV, radio, social media polls also make reference constantly to medieval rulers, and they all often appear in these lists of the greater nationals of all time. Uh, baby names are, are often are you know, kind of Tomislav in Krasimir in Croatia and Simon in Bulgaria and Dusan in Serbia. Uh, uh, so, so, so this is kind of part of, uh, it's embedded in society and it's dominated by ordinary people uh, ordinary kind of civil society groups uh, and the state is not the only one there. So the mythology of golden age infuses many areas of everyday life and is perpetuated by millions of people throughout the region. Uh, so, so that's what I'm arguing that this golden ageism is an ideological project pursued by different social organizations to enact different types of social transformation. They offer ideological matrix for a variety of groups across the political spectrum. So the purpose is not, uh, you know, to, to kind of maintain status quo. Obviously, state does that as well. Obviously, state, state competes with these different groups and wants to monopolize these images. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it sometimes it's able to do that. In other occasions, it's not. So this has less to do in, in the 20th century with the nostalgic longing and much more with the competition between different social and political groups for public attention. So the golden age myths deploy, uh, you know, these images because pre precisely because they are so familiar, uh, you know, they're they're routinely routinely uh, 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 perpetuated and used and in, in everyday life, and they're very recognizable as the symbols of nationhood. They are not questioned, you know, they they are all you know, kind of embodied the nation. Uh, so, so in that sense, these different group uh, position themselves and make themselves visible. In the, this ideologically congested public uh, space, you know, in public sphere. Uh, so, uh, so, so what I argue is that kind of looking at these golden age myths, it tells us also a lot about the character of nationalism, how it's changed and how it's become much more grounded in everyday life, in institutions, everyday life. It's dependent on increased organizational capacity of the state and ideological penetration of the, of the, uh, uh, the, the nationalism has throughout society as, as a whole. Okay, so I'll stop here now and uh, let me just see how to get out of here. Stop share. Okay. Thank you, Professor Malashevich. Now, our next presentation and the concluding presentation is uh, would be that of, <coughs> sorry, of Ambassador Vesp. Kogarcevic, who is also the professor of the practice of uh, IR at the Pardee School of Global Studies, Boston University. He was a former ambassador of Montenegro through Brussels, to Brussels, to Brussels uh, and NATO. The title of his presentation today is the EU's enlargement dilemma, 
do the EU and the Western Balkans share the same future? Ambassador Garcevic, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Serja. I would like to thank you for organizing this event and uh, for uh, giving a chance to be with uh, the uh, distinguished panelists uh, and to contribute to some extent to your discussion. My, my presentation is maybe uh, forward-looking, forward-leaning. Uh, we have had discussions about the past, uh, though uh, or previous conversation in uh, uh, answering to the questions of uh, the audience, uh, actually uh, somehow serves as a good um, uh, entry into what I'm planning to uh, speak about in my presentation. I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with this and that I will not um, outline anything new to people who follow carefully, attentively the Western Balkans and its relation with the European Union. What I actually want to highlight here is that, um, you know, uh, that, uh, not to just uh, take uh, the Balkans and Western Balkans, the region uh, solely responsible for what's going on right now uh, in all parts of the world. Uh, now many of my, uh, I would say, colleagues and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and associates and friends uh, sometimes tell me that I'm some, um, can be cited when in my, in my focus on uh, European Union and its role in the Balkans. But I would say that it is politically correct to criticize and victimize Balkan states for what they didn't do. Uh, and uh, this is not like a justification for the lack of uh, democratic reforms done by them. But uh, uh, in that narrative, that narrative actually forgets uh, the role of the European Union. Um, and um, if you look back, you know, uh, back from the moment when um, Balkan states, Western Balkan states and European Union agreed on uh, the, its um, uh, European Union agenda and perspective uh, in 2003 in Thessaloniki, we may agree that both sides bear responsibility for the success of the process. Uh, and uh, since the process is having problem right now, you know, uh, that both sides are also to be held responsible for uh, what's going on in the region. Uh, you know, Western Balkans has failed to deliver comprehensive democratic reforms, but uh, European Union Brussels failed to remain politically committed to the enlargement, to enlargement process, to the enlargement process, and to be politically involved in the, in the region. Uh, and in fact, there is a clear correlation, in my view, between reform fatigue and enlargement fatigue. Uh, uh, you know, these two ends of the same equation, um, you know, they are connected because when the EU was involved in the first, uh, more involved and particularly politically involved in the first decade of uh, uh, European Union uh, perspective, let's call it like that, from 2003 until 2013, uh, that involvement was followed by reforms um, uh, in, the, in the region and reforms were graining ground, whether they were graining ground uh, according to the pace that uh, some uh, of us from the region expected, it's another question, but definitely we were experiencing a positive trend in the re in, in, in all parts of the world. Since 2013, uh, with the, uh, you know, with the Croatia uh, as a new member to the, to the European Union, uh, I would say the Brussels uh, appetite for enlargement has waned um, and gradually, as it uh, as it is the country's appetite for the continuation of reforms. So, uh, what we can witness, or as I describe the, that part of, of, and I will be speaking about this later on, uh, this part of of, of 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 the process is, you know, period of uh, rapid democratic backsliding in the Western Balkans and growing enlargement fatigue on the European Union side. The importance of your perspective is definitely high and it should remain so. Uh, uh, the European Union perspective was a catalyst for change. Be honest, um, uh, uh, Europe, all uh, political elites in the Balkans uh, reluctantly embraced uh, the idea of uh, democratic reforms. And uh, only uh, 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 they were inspired actually, the, the incentive of the membership served as an inspiration for them to embark upon this challenging uh, process. Uh, so when there is not that uh, 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 perspective um, clearly on horizon, uh, we cannot expect uh, um, countries to continue with reforms. So European Union perspective therefore um, was and 
it still remains Brussels' most powerful currency, which means soft power. Uh, the European Union has been involved uh, besides on that uh, in different areas, including, uh, you know, uh, financial, uh, which the European Union is playing, has been playing a role of uh, the most important investor in the region. The, the last the European Union Western Balkan Summit confirms that, that the European Union uh, came up with the economic and investment plan and guidelines for the implementation of so-called the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans. Green Agenda is uh, valued um, uh, 30 million, uh, 30 uh, billion dollars, sorry, European, <laughs> sorry, euros. Uh, but um, I would say that, you know, uh, this financial injection or financial projects uh, presented by European Union without a clear European perspective, uh, you know, they don't, don't serve as a currency uh, anymore. Why it is so? There are other players in the meantime because geopolitical scene has changed and dynamics in the region also has, uh, has changed. There are other players who seem to be giving similar financial offers um, uh, to the political elites in the region, but not asking for reforms in return. Uh, in the eyes of uh, the people um, uh, in the region, actually, uh, those who are uh, in, in, in uh, policy makers in the region, uh, alternatives, actually, uh, those who are now active in the region, which uh, uh, importance is growing, like China, they can be a viable alternative to the European Union, though European Union uh, still doesn't accept this as, a, as an option. Uh, viable alternative because, uh, as I already said, uh, the way how they do business uh, and um, the way how they uh, see uh, development agenda uh, is closer to the mindset of uh, people in the Western Balkans than uh, you know reform agenda promoted by, uh, by European Union. Uh, therefore, uh, in my view, uh, uh, financial packages uh, without being uh, uh, coupled, combined with a clear, renewed uh, uh, and uh, reinvigorated European Union uh, uh, perspective uh, will not bear fruit uh, in the region. So if we look how these uh, positive trends from the uh, 2003 and 2013 have reversed, so, um, you know, uh, I know that we all can agree on a couple of points. First of all, the EU process has not prevented state capture, endemic corruption, infringement on media freedom, environmental degradation, and definitely as a result of it, brain drains. So distrust, distrust, uh, distrust is in state institutions uh, and their capability to deliver to citizens um, is a regional mantra. Uh, and I would say that current COVID-19 pandemic is just uh, one example. Uh, citizens often uh, uh, justify their decision not to get vaccinated with lack of trust uh, to institutions uh, who are behind the, uh, the process of actually promoting uh, promotion of uh, vaccination as the uh, most efficient way uh, to fight uh, the pandemic. Uh, given the fact that the European Union is withdrawing, or uh, we can describe it as a, let's say, sleeping mode, the concept of corporate illiberal governance seemed to bear fruit. Uh, and we discussed this uh, uh, just like a 15, 20 minutes ago. Uh, I would say that the liberal tendencies have been flourishing uh, as there is nothing to stop them. Uh, the, robust, the robust Western and European involvement uh, is lacking currently. Uh, and I don't think that uh, uh, this will be changed in the foreseeable future. Uh, what is the driving force behind the liberal uh, tendencies in the region? Uh, I can describe as unconstrained nationalism. You know, the region is experiencing again a revival of chauvinism or again experiencing chauvinism, history of revisionism and genocide, genocide denial. Um, just a, a brief cursory look at um, what you can find in media currently uh, and what type of narratives are, have been popularized uh, by, official, uh, by officials and uh, echoed, uh, amplified by media confirm that, you know, they uh, confirm the idea and the motive to unweave uh, uh, results of um, uh, Western involvement in the late, uh, let's say, 
and 20th century and uh, first decade of, of uh, 21st century. So the Balkans is, I would say, a region is at a watershed. Uh, and, um, you know, it needs more uh, involvement, but uh, in the reality, the perspective has never been more distant, I would say, and process more diluted than it looks now. Um, back in time, in two, one, 2003, uh, few uh, would expect, uh, including people from the West, from Brussels, and from the Boston Balkans, that by 2021, most countries from the region would have not been in the EU or on the verge of joining. Uh, at this point, I think that we are as far from the European Union as we were in 2003, if not further, uh, further uh, away from uh, membership. So uh, relationship between uh, the region and the uh, EU, in my view, resembles a slow fade, um, which means a romance that is nearing its end. Uh, partners don't fully trust one another. Uh, they are considering alternative options, though at the surface, uh, at the rhetorical level, in terms of narrative still present, uh, they still talk about their common future. So as uh, it is popular to say, uh, the candidate countries pretend they want to reform and the European Union pretends that want them to join the club. Um, from the regional perspective, the process uh, also resembles something that can be called hamster on a wheel effect. In their eyes, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the membership has become a long shot. The journey is getting longer and longer, and the European Union is not offering any refreshments uh, on the way uh, to the European Union. Uh, the example of uh, visa liberalization can serve how European Union can incentivize uh, countries to do necessary reform if they have clear goal um, uh, and have something uh, to, you know, help them do that. Uh, that said, you know, in the case of Kosovo, uh, for example, um, uh, you know, the country has met all necessary criteria for visa liberalization, Brussels is hesitant to deliver what has been promised, which then also speaks about a credibility of the process, a credibility of the European Union in this moment to deliver what they promised. The same is with the, uh, in the case with North Macedonia and Albania. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, all together, uh, from the perspective of the Western Balkan states, uh, how to say, keep their motivation to continue with the uh, necessary reform at the, uh, the very low level. Uh, and they don't trust Brussels anymore as Brussels don't, uh, doesn't trust them um, uh, anymore. So um, hope is needed. And uh, we, uh, you need to, how to say, in my view, uh, to uh, reinvigorate the process and to put more credibility behind this. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, what we uh, see instead is that uh, enlargement of the European Union is uh, critically low on the European Union agenda. Uh, and uh, the, current, the last uh, European Union Western Balkans Summit has confirmed that. I would say that, and I will try to uh, outline three major, how to say, points uh, often used by European member states when it comes to Western Balkans or enlargement in general, uh, um, and why they uh, don't see enlargement being so uh, 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 popular, actually, um, as why they are not, we are not arguing for enlargement anymore so vividly. Uh, first of all, uh, this is the first argument is that you know, the European Union negative experience with new members and their democratic regression. Uh, as you can as you remember, Bulgaria and Romania were for a long time in the focus and taking this example that uh, of new members who didn't meet necessary criteria but joined uh, the club uh, prematurely. Now, uh, uh, this has been taken by uh, Hungary and Poland, first of all, to some extent, Czech Republic, and uh, as, uh, as of recently, um, uh, 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 Slovenia. But uh, although this point was, is valid and justifiable, I would say this argument underrates uh, the good performance of other newcomers. You know, uh, there are other candidates and former candidates and new members who have been doing very well, uh, like uh, Baltic states, 
and then uh, um, you know actually in the meantime they become um, if we can like a rate them um, uh, so become somehow uh, members of like a those um, better part of uh, European Union so uh, but more importantly in my view the argument about um, democratic regression among uh, uh, new members um, uh, conceals the challenges that several old members uh, have with their far right and populist parties because uh, uh, far right movements and populism is not phenomenon that we can attach to new members only. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you, this um, uh, enlargement fatigue has more to do with the attitude of the traditional European conservatives, liberals, and their partners on the left than with uh, uh, you know, populists themselves, because populists are not in power uh, in, um, um, uh, in, in, uh, in majority of, uh, the vast majority of, of, of European uh, member states. So the second argument uh, used against enlargement is that, uh, that one, that, uh, which I already explained, other performance of candidate countries. This, this is also true, you know, but uh, it also hides uh, what I mentioned that uh, the process uh, has two ends and that, uh, you know, uh, we cannot expect new countries or candidate countries to proceed uh, vigorously with the uh, uh, reform agenda without having Brussels being involved uh, in uh, this process uh, more actively. And this involvement is not just a technical involvement because the process of enlargement has become over, over, uh, over, over time technical and countries see it as like a just ticking box uh, and trying to sometimes cheat as uh, students often try to do or sometimes try to do. Uh, 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 what is needed uh, in, in instead is more political uh, involvement of um, a very important uh, European Union member states uh, in, in, in the region. Then, uh, you know, finally, this also brings me to the, um, you know, uh, rise of populism, far right movements, and Eurosceptic parties in the EU itself. As I already mentioned, you know, this is to be taken into account, but uh, 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 focus is more on traditional um, uh, European parties, which are in uh, power, and which, uh, in order to, how to say, please their waters, uh, uh, changing their, shifting their political profiles more towards a right uh, uh, and then uh, sacrificing enlargement as part of this uh, shift. So uh, the far right populists uh, de definitely effectively uh, exploit people's concern about illegal migration, the influx of foreign workers and security problems. Um, and the push for restoration of national sovereignty, which we see in several uh, European member states. Uh, and they are actually uh, opposing for the uh, deepening of European Union and asking for devolution of power in the European Union through pre maastricht times. But, uh, you know, uh, they're still, honestly speaking, in minority uh, in, in the European Union. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are not mainstream uh, when it comes to those who are in position to make decisions about the future of Western Balkans. So to make it to conclude, um, maybe uh, this conclusion will be totally provocative, but I would say that European Union and Western Balkans don't share the same future, at, at least not the midterm future. Uh, you know, uh, placing candidates in a waiting room to be observed for decades uh, doesn't help and the old case confirms it. Uh, on, on, um, uh, further on, you know, I think that it's a myth that democratic transformation leads to a happy ending. Uh, most countries, if not supported continuously, uh, then just are stuck in the middle and it is where uh, the Western Balkans is uh, at this point. So, um, I would say also that European Union, uh, at least uh, that looks like uh, uh, at, 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 at the surface, that European Union seems unaware of the risks of blurring the European perspective. 
uh, and that uh, this also means supporting an atmosphere that uh, is conducive for local nationalists and the Eurosceptics to thrive. And uh, if I can go further with my elaboration, uh, it can resemble uh, sleepwalking towards another conflict. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, it looks also that European Union either has no remedy for the region or is not looking for one at this moment. Um, and uh, personally, I don't want to believe that European Union seems not to pay attention uh, to all region for things have not yet spiraled out uh, of control. Uh, if they are waiting for this to happen, then it would be already late. I will stop this with my um, uh, with my remarks uh, and um, waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador Garcevich, and thank you both to uh, Dr. Malesevic and you for uh, enlightening presentations and a reminder about the atavistic passions of nationalism and how uh, alive and well those are, as well as the uh, all the complexities of a love-hate relationship between the Western Balkans or as uh, as, you know, uh, as uh, Joseph Brodsky at some point called it Western Asia and the European Union. Uh, before uh, letting others ask questions, I will now abuse my substantial powers uh, uh, as a moderator of this conference and uh, pose two questions to uh, each of you, to Professor Malesevic, I was wondering if you could possibly speak a bit more to the persistent na narrative that uh, argues uh, about one glorification of the past, one construction of the golden age of a specific ethnic group or nation is uh, quote unquote patriotic or less threatening, less hegemonic. Uh, Then the similar process originating within the confines of a proverbial other. In this particular case, we can talk about relationship between Montenegro and Serbia because in both places we can certainly witness and uh, document and this glorification of the past uh, and this discrepancy between arguments about na nationalism on one side and patriotism as a exclusively benevolent defensive mechanism. Could you speak to that a little bit more? And to Professor Garcevic, uh, uh, how would you interpret the EU position vis-a-vis -vis the Western Balkans when the, and you spoke to that, but I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more, when the EU does not react and even does not condemn secessionist uh, activities by by wartime political leaders in the Balkans. This includes Serbia with regards to northern Kosovo and the manufacturing of crisis there, as well as the more recent activities of the political leadership in the Republic of Srpska. Uh, how does that discrepancy look to you and, and in, in light of the rather complicated marriage proposal that you were describing a minute ago? Thank you very much indeed. Should I go first then? <laughs> uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Your, your connection, your connection was not best, so I, I got bits and pieces of your question there. But that's okay. I think I know what you're saying. <laughs> so, so it's just a, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I could, I could, I, I could, I could summarize it in a single sentence. <laughs> it is, it is uh, your comment that I'm seeking. Your comment about the distinction between patriotic golden age narratives as being non-threatening as opposed to golden age and glorification of the past from the other, proverbial other, that seems to be hegemonic or is interpreted as such. Uh, yeah. and so I was wondering if you could talk about that a little yeah. bit. Okay, I mean, it, keep, it keeps, <laughs> the link is not ideal. That's fine, I got, I got it. I think, I mean, the golden age narratives are used by all ideologies, uh, you know, across the political spectrum. Uh, Libertarians invoke some sense of, you know, kind of when there was no state, things were, you know, market determined everything. 
uh, left wing also has its golden age. And Mitya studies this sort of <laughs> as well in, 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 in a kind of more contemporary uh, context. Uh, uh, liberalism has its own golden age. Uh, so everybody invokes some sense of past to justify you know, uh, contemporary context and future action and, and so on. So that's the same with, with nationalism. Nationalism, you know, you, you have a ethnic versions of nationalism, you have a civic versions of it, what you call patriotism, which I don't like as a term. For me, this is all nationalism, it's just different intensity and different emphasis and here and there. Uh, so, so obviously, I mean, any of these narratives can be used. And that's what I said, even during the state socialism, you know, all of these golden age narratives were present. They were institutionalized. Uh, you know, if you remember well, you know, visiting Zagreb and and, and seeing the the, the uh, 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 monument of of King uh, Zvonimir at, at the you know uh, uh, rail station, uh, there you 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 saw the, the, what was written down about unity of Serb and Croat people. You know, and obviously they've changed that as, as soon as uh, HDZ was in power. <laughs> so, so, so I mean, all, all the, you know, the, the different uh, uh, articulations, different ideological articulations, rely on, on golden age narratives. And, uh, and 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 as you know yourself in Montenegro, this is really interesting the way how golden age, medieval golden age, is used by both by, by, by Montenegrin and Serbian nationalisms. Differently, although I think Montenegrins have, have, have now monopolized more of it. So, so I think the Serbian nationalism in Montenegro is probably relying more on Serbian golden age than, than it did Montenegrin. Uh, so, so yeah, both of them are present. I mean, obviously, it, it is different if you if you if you are if you're using this uh, as, as a state and are able to kind of channel that, monopolize it through you know education system and, and mass media, particularly in, in authoritarian or semi-authoritarian context. But it's also for me. It's also interesting to study civil society and how they relate to this. You know how this is much more visible now than it was ever before. Uh, thank you so very much indeed. Uh, the same goes with me. Yeah. I, uh, you know, but I think that I I, I understood well your question, Sergio. I will begin with. Um, uh, I think something that everybody of us uh, know well that. Uh, not doing enough or um, playing a role of a bystander at the time of conflict means siding by a stronger side. Uh, uh, we have that experience from the beginning of the uh, breakup of Yugoslavia when the international community uh, not being ready to intervene at the time actually uh, were reassuring one of the sides, a uh, stronger side that they can continue further with their politics. So I would say that I see the logic. I see the logic. I read the same uh, the same logic uh, uh, in the EU approach at this moment. Um, um, I'm not saying that the EU is supportive to what Dodik, for example, has been doing, or is supportive to um, if, um, uh, President uh, Vucic. But if the former Prime Minister of Austria, since we are now uh, in this institute, and if the former Prime Minister of Austria is paying visit, was paying visit to, uh, uh, to Belgrade at the time of uh, a confrontation between Belgrade and Kosovo to say that he is impressed with the reforms done by Serbian government and Vucic himself, then you know, then uh, it, it tells volume about uh, where European Union stands or uh, how European Union have a problem to take clear, firm uh, a stance on what's going on in the Balkans right now. I would describe this, uh, of, forgive me if I may be strong in my description, but I would describe this as a appeasement. A policy of appeasement never worked and will ne regrettably, regrettably uh, would not work in the Balkans either. I'm deeply concerned uh, with the development in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I'm deeply concerned, uh, not anymore as a, uh, as a person from the region and as one who uh, in my lifetime have experienced uh, similar things happening. So uh, I think it's high time for something more than uh, words. And what we are, uh, have, been, um, um, have been hearing from um, the Brussels uh, is just words. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, because it is already 6 a.m. in Australia, I wish a good night.
sleep or good day sleep to our friend and colleague, uh, Professor Halilovich, and also invite the rest of the panelists to weigh in uh, and ask questions uh, and open discussions about the uh, presentation by Professor Maleshevich and Ambassador Garcevich. Following that, uh, we will have to address two questions from the viewers. So I open the floor to the panelists. Okay, shall I wait for the no, 10 more seconds and then move to the questions from the audience? Okay, we have two uh, questions from the same viewer. One is uh, to the ambassador Gertrovich and the second one uh, is more of a comment, which I believe invites uh, an answer or an explanation to Professor Maleshevich. So to Ambassador Garcevich from Jason Gold, uh, through the EU's procrastination vis-a-vis -vis accession, specifically Montenegro, it has left the door open for disruptive forces to enter the domain. In the same way that NATO has than in Bosnia, Putin is taking full advantage of this and in doing so has managed to destabilize both institutions in the region simultaneously. Please comment. And for uh, Professor Maleshevich from Jason Gold again, there is a world of difference between nationalism and patriotism. Please do comment on those. Thank you. Who is going to be the first uh, uh, initial Ambassador. Okay, I will do the first one. I, right I can't but agree with the comment, comment slash question uh, by the viewer. Um, I think that uh, the process uh, in which uh, the West retreats um, or is getting um, uh, less enthusiastically in, involved in the Balkans, uh, and in the case of uh, the case of uh, European Union. Uh, uh, enlargement process, uh, as I explained, uh, the process is still there, but more in technical in nature. So uh, this uh, definitely opens the door for other actors to play in. Uh, uh, you know, there is no such a thing as vacuum uh, in uh, uh, global affairs. If there is a certain place which uh, is not, how to say, filling with others, like in either like a, uh, in our case, uh, agenda, uh, revolving around enlargement, then other players will benefit of it. And uh, uh, Russia is not a new uh, actor in the Balkans. Uh, not uh, Balkans not is not necessarily the uh, how to say the uh, the biggest priority for Russia. Immediate neighborhood is for them biggest priority. But uh, it's a good bargaining chip for them. And if the door is open, they will use uh, that opportunity and exploits uh, vulnerabilities of other actors. Uh, in this case, as you explained, um, uh, EU and NATO. I fully agree that you should uh, be doing more and NATO should be doing more in, 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 the, in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Let me ex briefly explain and then I will stop. For example, if you give Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, preconditions that you know uh, beforehand that they are not able uh, to meet, then actually uh, you, 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 you are putting them into the corner. Uh, I would try if I, in the EU case or in NATO case to give them something which they can deliver as precondition and to unpack the process. And then you, once they are on board, you know, the pace of the process, you can, uh, every, uh, can be controlled by Brussels anyhow. So uh, I don't see a problem with that. But I see problem with the uh, commitment <clears throat> by Brussels side. Uh, 
Thank you, Ambassador Gatchevich. Professor Malashevich. Okay, so, so this is a usual question you get. <laughs> uh, I mean, in the national, we have the nationalism studies and nationalism studies, people, I mean, we don't have patriotism studies. This is a concept used in normative political theory, which is historically very specific, really from Roman, uh, Roman Republic onwards. Uh, and, and as a sociological phenomenon, we don't really talk about patriotism. This is a term usually that nationalists use for themselves. So as a sociological phenomenon, you can call it whatever you like. It's, it's like gravity. We live in the world of nation states and any sense of attachment to loyalty is to nation state. It's not to an empire, it's not a patrimonial kingdom, it's not to city state. So, so, so the question is how you study nationalism. And this, I mean, I've written many books on this. So I, I, you know, if you read any of my books, you'll find out how I approach this phenomenon. Thank you very much indeed. I second your comments. Uh, knowing full well that they might not resonate benevolently among my friends and colleagues in Montenegro, but uh, political reality you know, infused with emotions is one thing and academic discourse is something quite, uh, quite different. Uh, they are thanking us both for this and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm uh, really happy that we had the chance to have this uh, half a day talk. It was a small, numerically small, but mighty group. And I do hope that next time we will meet in person, far, far away from any threats of any viruses or political instabilities uh, and have a greater contribution by colleagues who this time around and have to run able for different reasons to join us. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Garanter, the director of the Witt Institute, to say a few words, concluding and closing up our proceedings. But before I do that, I just wanted to uh, repeat what I wrote to some of you, if not all of you, you that the plan is to have uh, your papers as more fully developed academic papers with citations uh, published either as a special issue of an academic journal or if I managed to bring in additional contributors as a book. So please keep that in mind and we will correspond about it later. But now I invite uh, Professor Carpenter to say a few words and on my part, Thank you kindly. I do apologize for your time, your benevolence, and your effort uh, in helping me put together this important conversation. Thank you very much indeed again. Super well. Good afternoon. Um, I, I, I should say, I'll make the, ob the obvious observation, I'm sure obvious to everybody, that these last two presentations were so um, beautifully paired. Uh, in so far as we have the opportunity to think about um, the relationship between um, past and, and uh, present, and of course, then a, a talk about um, what the future holds with respect to the relationship between the, uh, the Balkans, the Western Balkans, especially, and uh, the European Union. So, I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't have been more uh, neatly put together, and they serve uh, uh, to wonderfully bring this uh, this short but uh, very substantial uh, conference session to a close. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for participating and the audience uh, as well, and especially uh, Sergia for doing, a, a, I think, a wonderful job of, uh, of moderating uh, in the face of many uh, technological, logistical issues, uh, and he, he held it all together. Uh, brilliantly. So um, thank you for that. And just, just in general, I would echo his um, comments of appreciation to everyone for their patience and willingness to understand that the internet can be uh, unpredictable sometimes. Um, from my perspective, I'm just very impressed by the, um, the collegiality of this, uh, this group, um, the, the robust uh, response to the, um, uh, in the question and answer sessions, especially um, it's clear to me, uh, it was clear to me from the start that there are, there are very big questions uh, 
uh, at stake. There are big questions to consider, um, especially if we think back to the opening keynote, the, the responsibilities and the, the challenges that researchers such as yourself um, face with respect to this uh, with respect to this topic it's very clear that remembering uh, documenting analyzing all of these kinds of things uh, that uh, we do as academics um, that these are all um, they're all especially fraught it seems to me um, uh, and and are very uh, they can be they can become very complicated activities in the, in the context of um, studying um, um, Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. Um, and clearly this area of study inspires a, a very passionate engagement from, from you as scholars and, uh, and, and is clear even too from the, the questions from the, uh, the audience. So um, I, would, I would commend you, uh, everybody, everybody who was involved in this conference, presenters and audience with, uh, for offering very, um, I think for them, very balanced and very uh, nuanced perspectives um, and very thoughtful um, responses uh, to questions as well. So um, it, all in all, from my perspective, a very uh, uh, in, informative and engaging conference. And maybe I could just say to close, um, following uh, Serge's final remarks about uh, assembling a uh, assembling a publication uh, in some form. Sergio, you and I should uh, talk about that as well and, uh, and the possibility of, of collaborating with the uh, Worth Institute in some way. It would make sense to maintain that continuity and I'd be, I'd be very happy to, to talk about that and get behind a project like that. So I think yes, that's all. Oh, okay, I missed that. Um, Okay, I think that's I think that's uh, all. I guess it, it falls to me to um, to close the uh, to close the event. I would uh, say thank you again to everybody and wish everybody a, a good day or a good night, depending on on um, where you are. And I hope, echoing Sergio again, I hope uh, at some point in the not too distant future that I can meet some or all of you in in person for uh, for uh, an event uh, similar to this. So until then. Thanks very much to Sophie as well for organizing all of this. And despite going through all the health issues and technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, on my behalf, you know, thank you so much. Thank and you so much. Bye. Bye. Take care. I'm going to be here with you. Oh, thank you. Sven Aibolia. Thank you, guys. Hvala. Sven Aibolia.